right now on KCCI 8 News Close Up. Democratic presidential candidates Bernie Sanders and Beto O'Rourke. In an exclusive sit-down interview, Senator Sanders talks about his health and his Iowa campaign. Plus, he weighs in on Syria and the impeachment inquiry. And former Congressman Beto O'Rourke tells us about the status of his campaign in Iowa and his plan to reach more caucus goers. Also this morning, the issues that are important to Iowa's African-American community. We'll preview an upcoming NAACP presidential forum. KCCI 8 News Close-Up starts right now. This is Iowa's news leader. This is KCCI 8 News Close-Up. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders returned to Iowa this past week. It was his first visit since his heart attack. KCCI chief political reporter Cynthia Fodor sat down with the senator to discuss his caucus campaign, the big issues now facing our country, and of course, his health. I'm feeling really well. Um, you know, I had a clogged artery, uh, and that was taken care of. I spent uh, two days in the hospital and got out. Uh, and I'm feeling great. And how did that change you, or did it change you or your outlook in any way, having gone through that? Well, it changed me in the sense of taking a hard look at adversity for me and my family uh, and for people all over this country. You know, the procedure that I had is done about a million times a year, so it's not an unusual procedure. And in terms of healthcare, I'll tell you something. When I was feeling bad, I went to the doctor and I went to the hospital, and I just wonder how many people in Iowa, or Vermont, or all over this country, when they're feeling bad, they're sitting around saying, oh my God, if I go to the doctor, if I go to the hospital, I can't afford it. And maybe I'm gonna end up with a medical bill that will bankrupt my family, and that's not right. So that's one of the things that it did make me think about, is the need to make sure that every person in Iowa, Vermont, and this country can go to the doctor, can go to the hospital, and not worry about what's gonna happen when they get that bill because under a Medicare for All program, they will not get that bill. And you spent two days um, in a hospital bed. What did you learn about our healthcare system on a personal note? Well, I was very fortunate. I mean, you know, it's, um, uh, I was taken to a hospital in uh, Las Vegas, uh, which has a very strong cardiology unit. The doctors there were great. The nurses there were great. I'm very grateful, not only for what they did, uh, but for the kind of support that we received from all over this country. So many people uh, were praying for my recovery uh, and were sending me well wishes that I'm, I just want to thank them all. But at the end of the day, what worries me so much about our health care system is that many people who don't have any health insurance or are underinsured with high deductibles and co-payments, they don't go to the doctor when they should. And then you got others who are sick and end up in the hospital and they end up with a $100,000 bill uh, and they're not able to pay that bill. And we got a half a million people go bankrupt every year as a result of medical bills. Can you imagine that just because you come down with cancer or heart disease that you go bankrupt? That is not what should be happening in America. And that is why I'm going to accelerate my fight for a Medicare for All system which says regardless of your income, you go to the doctor, you go to the hospital, there is no bill. There is no premium. There is no copayment. There is no deductible. There is no out-of-pocket expenses. You get the health care that you need because you're an American and you're entitled to it. That's what exists in Canada. That's what exists in countries all over the world. We're going to fund it through uh, the general tax base, not through premiums and not through out-of-pocket expenses. Most Americans will save money on their health care expenses. Uh, and it's the system that a democratic, civilized society should have. Des Moines, a lot of people here are trying to wrap their arms around the idea because being the second largest insurance center in the country, what would this mean for the dozens of insurance companies and, and employees in this city? It means that we will transition, you know, I, I consider myself to be the strongest pro-worker member of the United States Congress, so we're not against the workers who are in these companies. What we're going to do over a period of time is transition people out of the insurance industry into healthcare, where they're part of the process of trying to help people get better, keep people from getting diseases. But filling out forms uh, and engaging in billing and hounding people 
for money that they don't have is not something that our healthcare system should be about. So we want to put people to work in healthcare, not just in billing or administratively wasteful uh, processes. Let's switch to polls for Good. a moment. A number of polls are out, uh, new ones this week. Um, Elizabeth Warren moving ahead, in some you're up, in some you're down. That's right. What, what do you think of those numbers? I think you're right. Some were up, some were down. I think it is, for a variety of uh, reasons, it is, uh, polling is difficult. And some polling we're doing very well, some polling we're not doing so well. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think we are in a very different situation than we were last time I ran here in Iowa, where it was essentially a two-way race. I think you got a lot of folks out there. And as I'm sure you're aware, what, what the campaign comes down to, what the election comes down to, is not polling. It comes down to voter turnout. And here in Iowa, we have a great organization. I believe we have far more volunteers working on our campaign than any other campaign. And that means that on caucus day, uh, I believe we have the capability of bringing out a whole lot of people. Uh, and I believe we stand an excellent chance to win here in New Hampshire. And I think we have a strong path to victory. And when you talk about polling, for whatever polls are worth, there's almost no national poll uh, that, has not me, that does not have me beating Donald Trump, often by very large numbers. And um, speaking of President Trump, we've been talking a lot uh, about domestic policy and, and the debates and whatever, the focus this week, of course, on foreign policy and Syria. And um, you condemned his plan to keep some troops in Syria to control the oil fields. Why? Well, among other things, it's unconstitutional. I mean, the president cannot put troops any place he wants without authorization from Congress. Uh, second of all, the function of our troops is to protect American interests, not to protect oil uh, for some oil companies or, or anything else. Uh, the bottom line is that Trump's behavior with regard to Turkey and regard to the situation in Syria is a total outrage. It really is. Uh, to think that we are betraying uh, our Kurdish allies who have lost 10,000 soldiers fighting ISIS 20,000 wounded, and because of a phone call between Trump and Erdogan of Turkey, suddenly he is pulling these troops out, is disgraceful beyond words. And what it does is it sends a signal to our allies all over the world. You can't trust the United States of America. Traditional alliances will be broken at a moment's notice, and that is just a very, very bad, sad day for the United States. But you have said all along that you don't believe in these endless I wars going on, and, and that was the point he was making, that we don't need to stay. Well, I do not believe in these endless wars. I happen to believe that the war in Iraq was one of the great foreign policy blunders in the modern history of this country. I was one of the people not only voted against that war, I helped lead the opposition to the war, and I wish to God that my side had prevailed. It would be a very different world today. But. When we talk about ending endless wars, you don't do it by a tweet. You don't do it by a phone call. You work with your allies and figure out a way to safely and respectfully withdraw American troops while you leave the situation as stable with as much stability as possible. You don't suddenly wake up one day and say, oh, by the way, here's a tweet that I'm sending out. We're withdrawing American troops. We're betraying our long-term allies. That's not the way you do that. Turning to impeachment, we saw Republicans storm the room yesterday. Should there be more transparency in the hearings? There will be. There will be all the transparency. You know, what Republicans are trying to do there is uh, deny the reality that you have committees of which Republicans have all kinds of members on these committees. Uh, the bottom line is here is I think the Republicans in the Congress are getting very nervous. They're getting nervous that the American people are catching on to the fact that you have a president who is not only a pathological liar, who you can't believe whatever he says, but that this is likely the most corrupt administration in the modern history of this country. And I think if you look at obstruction of justice charges regarding Mueller's, the Mueller report, and how he tried to prevent that from going forward, that's an impeachable offense. I think if you look at um, the emoluments clause, and here is a situation, we have a billionaire president you would think that if you're president of the United States, you have enough to keep you busy. It's a pretty hard job. And he's busy worrying about getting people into his hotels and his resorts, making money out of his position as president. That is not only outrageous, happens to be unconstitutional. And thirdly, that 
this president is using military aid to the Ukraine in order to dig up dirt on a political opponent is also outrageous. So what the American people are entitled to, and they will get, is charges being levied against the president, impeachable charges. That debate will take place. Republicans will say, you know, have their right to defend the president. And then we go to the Senate, if, as I expect, the House does impeach, and you're going to have a, a, a full trial. And I hope very much that Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell allows for that full trial. The president has every right to have his defenders make their case. Prosecutors will make their case. The American people in the Senate uh, will listen to the evidence and make a decision. Up next on Close Up, former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke. His reaction to the latest that polls, plus to the top issues he has focused on during his caucus campaign. But pose no risk. Government buy in for all the people, not just the power. Welcome back to KCCI 8 News Close Up. Democratic presidential candidate and former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke returned to Iowa last week. He stopped by the studio for an interview with KCCI chief political reporter Cynthia Fodor, and they discussed the status of his campaign and what Iowans are telling O'Rourke out on the trail. We had the chance to be in Mount Vernon earlier this week at Cornell College, and meeting all those students, all the folks who came out, a real reminder that this race is still very fluid. A lot of people who said, you know, I was for another candidate until I heard you speak, or someone else told me this is the third time that I've heard, you know, finally made up my mind to commit to caucus for you. One of the things I'm learning is that people here in Iowa take this responsibility very seriously. They're performing their due diligence, they're vetting the candidates, such as myself, and they'll make a commitment, you know, perhaps sometime in the 30 days before the Iowa caucus. What's important for me to do is to be there now, to, to show up, to listen, to learn what's on their minds, and to share with them how this campaign can bring them in, defeat Donald Trump, and heal a very divided country. So I feel very good about the fact that we're here, very good about the people who are campaigning for us, knocking on doors, and I just want to make the most of this moment with the people of Iowa. Okay, so it's seeing their faces and their enthusiasm that's helping to give you the momentum to keep going. Absolutely, and having these conversations on health care, uh, having conversations about confronting climate change before it's too late, rewriting our immigration laws uh, to look like America based on our values and our traditions, ensuring this economy works for everyone so that no one has to work two or three or even four jobs to get by. These are the kinds of conversations that we're having across the state. And I think as people have a chance to meet me, hear my position on these policies, and then see a campaign that includes everyone, doesn't write anybody off. We welcome Democrats, independents, even Republicans. Nothing's gonna divide us from the very important work in front of us. So this is a campaign that brings everyone in and everyone together. And one of the reasons you're here this week is to talk to Latino communities uh, and their interest in hearing the presidential candidate's views on immigration. What are your plants for immigration reform? I want to make sure that 
people here in Iowa, in my home state of Texas, all across this country, who are working some of the toughest jobs in America, who may have come from another country, may be raising US citizen children here, don't have to continue to live in fear. I wanna legalize America, make sure that people can contribute even more to our shared success, strength, and security. And the best way to do that is to offer legal permanent status to those who are undocumented but pose no risk, no threat to this country. To make sure that dreamers, more than a million in America, become US citizens so that they can rise to their full potential. And then ensure that we have immigration laws that match our values, the needs that we have here in Iowa or in my home state of Texas, and guarantee that no one seeking asylum or refuge in this country is ever incarcerated or separated from their children. We, we can live our values and it will be good not just for those seeking asylum here, it'll be great for America, a country of immigrants, asylum seekers and refugees and their children. That's always been our story and that's always been key to our strength and to our success. And do you still support free health care for new immigrants? I support health care for everyone who is in this country. It is far less expensive to treat someone preventatively and proactively than waiting for them to show up at the ER or the county jail. It's also morally the right thing to do to make sure that in the wealthiest, the most powerful, the most medically advanced country, no one has to wait to get insulin for their diabetes, that curable cancers receive the treatment that they need, and that everyone can focus on their job or raising their family or going to school instead of navigating the bureaucracy and maze of health care and insurance today in this country. We have a real opportunity to make sure that America is healthy and well enough to rise to its full potential. And uh, since the deadly shooting in your hometown of El Paso, that has been much of your focus in terms of uh, gun control and uh, ways to control gun violence in this country. Um, your plan is very ambitious. What are the main points of your plan? We want to save the lives of our fellow Americans in, in a country that loses 40,000 lives a year, uh, a number and a rate not seen anywhere else in the world. We have to accept that this is a human cause problem with a human solution. So uh, universal background checks, extreme risk protection orders, also known as red flag laws, ending the sale of AR-15s and AK-47s, weapons that were designed for war and use on a battlefield, and then importantly, buying back the more than 16 million AR-15s and AK-47s that are out there. Because as we learned in El Paso, where 22 were killed by an AK-47, or as they saw in Dayton, Ohio, where nine were killed by an AR-15 in under 40 seconds, these weapons are devastatingly effective, not only at taking lives, but introducing terror in the lives of those survivors who remain. Straight ahead on Close Up, the concerns of Iowa's African-American community. We'll talk about the upcoming event hosted by the NAACP. That's right after this break.
Welcome back to Close Up. This week, Des Moines NAACP chapter is hosting Freedom Week. Here to talk about that and two big upcoming events is Cameron Middlebrooks. He's the president of the Des Moines NAACP. And uh, welcome. Thank you all for having yeah. me. So first off, what is Freedom Week? How did it get started? Perfect. So Freedom Week is a celebration of our year-end uh, banquet. Uh, we typically do a Freedom Fund banquet every single year, and it's our number one fundraiser, um, the only time that we do a fundraiser, where we celebrate the work that we've done in the community over the past year, um, and then also look forward to the future. Okay, um, the Freedom Fund is what that fundraiser is called, correct? And correct. Um, uh, who and what does that help? So that helps all the services uh, and advocacy uh, programs that we do throughout the year. Um, the NAACP has five strategic game changer areas um, that are economic sustainability, health, education, criminal justice, and then voter engagement. So throughout the entire year, our committees are working um, to advocate for people of color um, in the Des Moines and metropolitan area and trying to move the, move the ball forward. So this Friday is the Economic Empowerment Summit at Drake University. What uh, issues will you be tackling? Perfect. Then? So at our Economic Summit, we really want to focus on uh, young folks coming out and learning uh, financial literacy. Um, we ha understand that folks uh, are not always the best when it comes to handling their financial situations. So we want to give people an opportunity to hear about credit uh, and debt reduction, to hear about uh, investments um, and loan opportunities. We'll also have a small business track. So those that are interested in possibly starting their own small business one day, we have about three different programs um, that we have Iowa State University coming in, going over how do you actually start your business. Uh, we have community CPA coming in talking about legal structures um, and tax structures. And then we also have Iowa Legal Aid that will be coming in talking about uh, different legal hazards that you should look out and avoid when you're starting a business. Yeah, that's all very important and stuff. I know there was a study last year that showed that African American people here in Central Iowa don't have access, as great access to home loans and small yeah. business loans and things like that. What can your organization do to uh, address those concerns? So those are conversations that we're having with our city council, that we're having with state legislatures all the time, right? Um, there's disparate gaps um, in, in our economy. When you look at Des Moines, it's the number one place to live for uh, on a lot of different charts, but when you look at the African American community, there's a lot of dis disparities. Um, I think the state of Iowa in 2017, medium, uh, the median income for African Americans was just over 30,000, while their white counterparts was just over 58,000. That's a $30,000 $30, gap. Uh, we need to be working on plans uh, to, to help alleviate um, and really eliminate those wage gaps. All right, Cameron, we're not done with you yet. Stay right there. We will wrap up our conversation with NAACP Des Moines President Cameron Middlebrooks right after this break. You stay here, too.
Welcome back to KCCI 8 News Close Up. We're wrapping up our conversation with Des Moines NAACP Chapter President Cameron Middlebrooks. So this Saturday, the Des Moines NAACP is hosting an economic freedom town hall featuring a number of Democratic presidential candidates. So who's coming to the event? And tell us a little bit about the format. Perfect. So we have over 10 candidates uh, that are already scheduled to be there, uh, from Cory Booker uh, to Senator Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, uh, Sestak, uh, Mayor Pete. Um, there's so many to name, right? Um, so we're really looking forward to having a chance for them to engage with the community. Um, being that it is our Freedom Week, our number one goal right now is economics. Um, so we wanted to hear what their plan is and how they can help alleviate some of these disparities um, and then also build wealth in the African American community in Des Moines and across the country. Yeah, we hear all the time how well the economy is doing, but it's not doing well for everybody. Right. So it, it's very timely, and I'm sure for uh, the people who are impacted, uh, economics could not be a better topic for this. Exactly. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's, it's, the, it's the number one mover for a lot of people's families, right? Um, when you think about security, economic security, I think, is number one on people's minds. Um, are they making enough money to put clothes on their kids' back, food in their, in their family's mouths, roof over their head? Um, if those things are taken care of, I mean, everything else really doesn't matter. What do you hope to hear from these candidates? I mean, there is a message that mm -hmm. you're looking for. What yeah. is it? So I'm looking, uh, what specifically will you be able to do for small businesses, black owned small businesses? What specifically will you be able to do for that mother who's working two or three jobs and not still not making a, a livable wage? Um, there is you know, a lot of work that needs to be done at the state and local level, uh, but as, as president, um, you have, uh, there's a lot of movement that you can make as well. Okay, how does education play into this? Because educational opportunity is important True. to success as exactly. well. Exactly, so education, again, is one of our game changer areas, and those are some opportunities we wanna hear from these, these candidates. Um, what can they do to help alleviate some of the student loan debt? Um, what can they do to help uh, get folks, more folks into college? Um, and also knowing that college isn't the route for everybody. You have the trades, you have different um, secondary education opportunities that you can go through. So what resources can you get from the federal level to increase those opportunities as well? And, and real quickly, what does economic freedom look like to you? So economic freedom looks like to me, uh, it's a great question, it looks like prosperity. Uh, we believe uh, everybody should have an equal opportunity to succeed. Everybody should have an equal opportunity to be financial secure. And even more quickly, how do people get tickets to you? Great question. So you can see <laughs> us. Uh, all of our events are free uh, for the Freedom Week. You can go to NAACPDesMoines.org. All right. Cameron Middlebrooks, thank you very much. The Des Moines NAACP. And thank you for joining us on KCCI 8 News Close-Up. We'll see you back here next Sunday.